Today's video is going to be a little out of the norm for me because it's more of a response than it is like an original piece. I was sent a recent video from the channel Traveler, which you'll see posted up here and tagged down in the description, about 1911s and extractors, and specifically extractor tension. Traveler claims that extractor tension doesn't really matter on the 1911, and I found that to kind of be the opposite case where a lot of guns ship brand new these days, lacking correct extractor tension, or enough. When I say correct, there is a specific range that is outlined in various manuals, but it's not a thing that you necessarily have to put in that specific range. It's very much a trial and error, test it and make it work type of deal. And extractor tension really does matter exceptionally more than it did in the past with all of the nine millimeter guns floating around the market where we have significantly more extractor tension that's required to hang onto the nine millimeter cartridge. So in this video, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about extractor tension and the stuff that we've had to do to our guns to make them work properly when it comes to extractor tension. But I'll also be giving you a bunch of resources that talk about extractors and extractor tension and how to make the 1911 a reliable platform. I will be linking everything down in the description. And for things that are not directly available online, I'll make like a Dropbox or a Google Doc file where you can just download the PDF for the various manuals that I reference. So let's get right into it. While I am talking a lot about the extractors and the things that I found wrong in Traveler's video, this is not meant to be an angry response video at him. Please don't think of that as what I'm trying to go for here. I don't dislike the guy. I just found the video to not really have a lot of the information that should be there for something called 1911 extractors, what you need to know. Please don't leave him any negative comments. Don't do anything of that nature. This is just me providing my two cents on the 1911 extractor topic. Let's get into the extractors. So what does the extractor in the 1911 do? The name is a little deceiving as you think extractor is just extracting the rounds out of the gun once we fired them or when we're unloading the pistol. However, the 1911 is a controlled feed platform, which means that the extractor plays a very big part in the feeding of the pistol. Let's demonstrate that here. To demonstrate controlled feed with the 1911, I have my Colt Series 70 gun worked over by Armand Swenson and two dummy rounds loaded in the magazine. As part of this, you'll kind of be able to see part of the process, but truthfully, this is easier with a diagram. If I manage to find a GIF or a diagram that shows controlled feed in the pistol, I'll link that down below. So I'm gonna let off the slide release here. We can see that as the slide clears the disconnector, it starts to hit the back of the round here. Round hits the feed ramp, will start to kind of pop up, and then boom, we get to have the round slip under the claw the extractor, and if I let go of the gun, we'll chamber here. So that's the first part of the controlled feed process with the extractor. The second part is, of course, extracting the cartridge. We'll just grab the slide here, and we're out. And again, the extractor on the 1911 does quite a few things as part of the controlled feed process. It's not just getting cartridges out of the pistol. So it is important that we have all of the right things going on with it. Do they need to be exactly textbook down to a single bit of TDP or a single dimension? Not really but there are quite a few elements that go into making the extractor work the best that it possibly can. So let's hop right into that. So what are the important elements for your 1911 extractor? Well, the big thing is that tensioning. We have my nine millimeter extractor here for my tank commander, which has quite a bit of a bend to it because of the nine millimeter cartridge. And then the 45 ACP extractor that's part of my TRP. That tension really does matter for lining up the cartridge into the barrel. Here we have the nine millimeter barrel, which has fairly thick walls for the chamber. And then we have the 45 ACP one, which is a fair bit thinner. One of the things is that if we have a very straight extractor in nine millimeter, there's a higher chance that the extractor is not gonna actually allow the round to position totally well into the chamber of the barrel. This is something that I did run into with this tank commander. And we had to pretty heavily work on the uh, extractor here on that gun. So the tensioning is important. Now, is it more important in some calibers? Absolutely. Nine millimeter and 38 super matter a whole lot more for your extractor tensioning than 45 ACP does. That said, it's still important in 45. It's just not as much of a big factor in 45. With Traveler's video, I think he said in the comments that he is very much a 45 guy or he's put more and more time through 45s. On nine millimeter, that would be a blind spot. If you haven't worked with the nine millimeter guns, you might not know what goes into them. What I will tell you is that with it being 2025, the nine millimeter 1911s, and of course the double stack guns or the 2011s out there, 
they are very, very, very popular. And those guns still require extractor tensioning work and extractor work to get done because they are 9mm 1911s at the heart of it. So aside from extractor tensioning, there are two other parts that we've noticed that are important when working on 1911s, and that is the bevel that goes onto the bottom of the extractor. Because again, this is a controlled feed gun, so kind of hard to see it, but the TRP's got the bevel there. It's got some carbon fouling, but you can see that kind of like sloped bit there. That bevel is what helps the, the rim of the round to slide up into the extractor claw. So having a decent bevel is important. And again, depending on the caliber, the bevel might be less or more important. We have had to bevel the 9mm one here, but it's not nearly as aggressive as 45. and I think part of that chalks up to the taper of the round and how the rim thickness is on 9mm. The other thing that matters is the sharpness or depth of the claw. And you can see here that they're different because of course 45 versus nine, but that is something that we have had to modify on some of the guns. All of these details are noted in a lot of classic manuals for working on the 1911. I'll link the Kuhnhausen volume one and two manuals down below where Jerry Kuhnhausen does deep dives into the 1911 platform. Extractor tensioning gets a lot of time in volume two, where he goes into the really deep details. Do you need to copy Jerry's exact measurements for your gun? No, not really, but it does show why certain dimensions are really important for that. I'll also link the gold cup manual that talks about adding and removing extractor tension for the 45 and 38 Super, and that's a manual from the 70s. So again, we're now 50 years back that people were talking about extractor tensioning. And then I'm also going to link a 1964 U.S. Army manual, which doesn't explicitly say anything about tensioning, but does talk about malfunctions that are caused by poor extractor tensioning. And again, I'll link that down below. I'm also going to be sharing a video by Jason Burton from Heirloom Precision. Jason's probably the foremost person when it comes to working on 1911s here on the planet these days. And he has a great video on extractor tensioning. I'll show you that technique here in this video, but I think his video does a great job with it too, especially if you're doing it for the first time. I also want to highlight my buddy Engineers Armory, who again is a 1911 junkie who's working on guns and is doing a full 2011 build right now. And he has certainly put a lot of time into the ins and outs of extractor tensioning. So I'm going to talk about the guns that we have had to work on, both myself and my friend Logan, who's done a lot of the custom work on my pistols. So let's hop right into that. For the tank commander, I've kind of already talked about the extractor work we've done for this gun. We had to put more tension on it, so giving it more of a bend. We had to do a bevel on the bottom of the extractor to aid in the controlled feeding. And we had to do some cutting on the extractor for the claw itself to give it a better amount of... Um, it, it, it wasn't a tensioning issue as much as it was canting the cartridge a little bit, so we had to modify that. Could I have bought in a Wilson Combat Extractor that had all these things fixed? Sure. But doing the work on this did not take very much time or very much effort. And with the TSOS guns, the quality is already pretty good there, so why not work with a good base gun? Logan's Garrison. I'm going to throw up a picture here because I don't actually have it here. Logan did a ton of work to that gun to make it work a lot better. The 5-inch 9mm platform is kind of prone to sluggish feeding and reliability issues. And for the extractor on that gun, Logan did have problems. Logan ended up replacing the extractor with one of the Wilson Combat Bulletproof ones, but it still required a good bit of uh, tensioning on there because of just how the 9mm extractors are in general. And Logan also had to do some cutting on part of the claw assembly, and I believe some beveling, although Logan will correct me in the comments down below if that's not the case. But I know a lot of work went into that, but that's kind of just the gripes of the 9mm 1911. The Swenson gun. We ended up swapping the factory cold extractor from the 70s for a new bulletproof uh, Wilson Combat one. The cold extractor was pretty well out of tune, and then the extractor claw had some damage to it, so we wanted to swap it. We still had to do a little bit of work on this to get it to work great in the gun. Part of it is that this is a fairly accurized 1911 that it kind of runs on the ragged edge of reliability in some cases. So we did a lot of effort to get the extractor working in this gun. I say effort, it just meant testing. It wasn't a lot of time itself. So we have a Wilson Combat Extractor. We barely did any bending to it, but we did have to do a little bit of tensioning to it. And then we did reprofile part of the bottom of the bevel on this uh, extractor here to aid in that controlled feeding. But again, nothing too crazy. The TSOS Stakeout. This is one of my favorite 1911s to shoot with kind of just how basic it is. And with the extractor we have in here, it is the factory extractor from TSOS. And all it required was a little bit of extractor tensioning. It was a little loose out of box and failed the 10.8 extractor test. However, 
It only took a little bit of bending, and we, I think we did that out in the field, so that was like a maybe two or three minute long process to get this gun shooting even more reliably. Simple enough to do. The Springfield TRP, the Totally Rad Pistol. This gun still has its original extractor here. We can actually see that it is marked 462, which is one of the numbers identifying this gun to itself for its own parts. And it's actually in pretty good shape. After we bought the gun and I did some testing, I did have extractor issues where the extractor was not tensioned enough, so we just did some quick tensioning and it works fine. You can see here that there's a little bit of the extractor claw and part of that bevel in the white. And that was either done by Springfield or done by one of the previous owners, because I've never had any issues with control defeating in this gun. This gun has fed very well. It's just that I did have some tensioning issues where it was failing the 10-8 extractor test, and also just failing uh, our in-shop test, which I'll be demonstrating later on here. But otherwise, just some tensioning, and this extractor's totally fine. The Kimber Custom 2, which I no longer have. That was a project for me for a little bit, but now Logan has it, and Logan's really enjoying the gun as a project pistol. One of the things that Kimber did well with that gun is that the extractor was properly tensioned and properly beveled. I had a hammer follow issues with that gun the first time I took it out, but no extractor problems. So good on you, Kimber. TSOS 1911A1 Government. This is like the cheapest TSOS you can buy. I bought it for some testing that'll be happening soon, which I, I'm getting around to doing. It's kind of scientific for me, so I have to get some work there. And the extractor on this gun has not been touched by myself or by Logan. And this gun does not have a properly tuned extractor. I did go out and shoot it, and you can see my first rounds for the pistol here on the channel. And it was reliable, except for an issue with the slide stop being oversized for the lobe that interacts with part of the follower. However, on a second testing session, I noticed that it did not pass the 10-8 extractor test. I haven't fixed it yet because I'm planning on damaging this gun, and I may as well fix everything that I'm planning on breaking with it once I get to the point that I break it. I think the extractor just needs to be bent a bit, which I could easily do, but I'm not planning on shooting this gun again until I get the testing done with it, so, yep. And the last gun is the Bullseye 1911. With how much work has been done to that gun, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the extractor was properly tensioned. I don't think the gun was shot a ton, uh, after it was accurized as a bullseye pistol. Like, yeah, it was shot and it was used, but it was certainly not um, like, like thousands and thousands of rounds. The extractor claws hanging on well, and it passed the shake test in the shop, but it also passed the 10-8 extractor test, which is really impressive for a gun of that age. But it's hard to tell if the extractor's original or one from the 50s. But either way, it actually did very, very well with it, but someone had been in there and monkeyed with it at some point in the past. So what if we want to add or remove tension from our extractor? It's a fairly simple process, but I can't take credit for this because I learned this through Jason Burton's video for Recoil TV. I have my stripped TRP slide. We can see no firing pin or extractor in here. And I have my extractor. This is very simple. We're going to take our extractor here and we're going to put it inside of the firing pin channel. Not the extractor channel, the firing pin channel. From here, we can bend the extractor either way that we need to to add or remove tension. If we, you can see underside here, we also go from the top down. We can see here if we bend it with the top down, the claw is facing to my right here. We can insert it. If we push on this way, we can apply more tension. If we push the other way, we can remove tension to make it a little bit looser. Again, really simple. There are specific numbers and ranges for what a proper extractor tension is supposed to be, but really this is a thing where you do it and then you go test it. How do we test it without live firing? Well, I'll show you that too, again using one of Jason Burton's techniques. To do Jason Burton's extractor tensioning testing, it's pretty easy to do. We need the slide, the extractor, your firing pin stop, your barrel, your barrel bushing, and then either a weighted snap cap or a live cartridge. Jason explicitly says that he wants to use a live cartridge because it will simulate the weight of a live cartridge better when you're shooting because this is a live cartridge. And if you're worried about any sort of safety concerns, keep in mind that the firing pin is not in the slide, so there's not really a way for this cartridge to detonate. So I like to use the live round because the rim thickness is also closer to what I actually do rather than the snap caps. Plus the snap caps, if you have shoot up rims, that can certainly play a part that wouldn't naturally be there when you're shooting. So the first thing we wanna do here is to put our extractor back into the extractor channel, kind of like if we were assembling the gun like normal, and we're gonna put our firing pin stop back into the slide. And this firing pin stop is a little tight, which I don't hate because it does help out a little bit with the recoil. From here, 
we can see that that is fully installed there. What I'm gonna do now is take my cartridge and slide it underneath of the extractor claw, which is obviously harder to do on camera than if we weren't. And I want it to roughly be about where it should be if we were shooting. And I can always kind of monkey around with it there. From here, we're gonna take our barrel and install the barrel back into the slide. We'll put our bushing and lock that into place. And then from here, so I was a little high there, we get our barrel into place. And then we want to push up. And that's to kind of simulate how the round would be in the barrel as part of the lockup when we're preparing to shoot. We want to push down, push back up. And then when we slide our barrel forward, we want to make sure that the round hasn't left the extractor here. So I'm going to push forward and we're still on the extractor. The next thing that Jason does is something that I've already been doing in my shop and I think is pretty handy. We just want to rotate the slide on the barrel axis like this. Thing I do is you also give it a little shake here. We just wanna make sure that the round doesn't leave the extractor. Now, if you have too much extractor tension, the barrel going over there would kind of show that. And if you had too little, the round would flop out at some point. This isn't the end all be all for testing that your extractor has proper tension, but we'll get to that here in a second. This is a pretty good way to do this at your workshop or at your house. And this is something that we generally do for most of our pistols when we're checking the extractor tensioning. For going out and doing live testing for the extractor, I like Hilton Yam's 10 extractor test. I know that Traveler doesn't like it, but I've personally gotten great usage out of this test for seeing how well my extractor is performing. I'm gonna throw up a little blurb here from Tim Lau, who is one of the guys who's worked with Hilton, in which he explains how to perform the test and the merits that you have with the test. I have found it to be exceptionally helpful for all of the 1911s that I have run through the paces here on the channel, whether they're project guns or new guns, I found it to be very helpful. The big thing here too is that we're shooting without the magazine in the gun because the magazine can act as a support to help get rounds out of the gun. When removing that, we're really isolating the extractor's performance. Now this test, as Tim puts in that post there, is not really applicable to a lot of more modern pistols that have different extractor designs. But for the controlled feed design of the 1911 and the way that the slide and frame and extractor all work together, this is a good test for that. Now I get that some people are probably gonna be unhappy that they're shooting the gun and having the slide go forward on an empty chamber. And yeah, we wanna generally avoid that when we're doing our administrative stuff with the gun. We don't wanna do 15 or 20 reps of just dropping the slide on nothing with a 1911 in particular. However, for this test, this is not a thing that we're doing for 100 reps at the range. We're doing it for 16 rounds to see how well the gun performs. This is something that I have done and not had any sort of damage or issues with even my higher performance guns, like the Swenson gun that we've done a lot of trigger work on. And again, this is really important for testing that reliability of the extractor. So if you don't wanna do it, hey, by all means, skip this test, but don't be surprised if your gun's not as reliable as it could be because you didn't properly identify some of the extractor tensioning issues or some of the angle issues on the bottom of the extractor or the claw. So. 10-8 test, would recommend it, and I'll get it on video at some point of me performing it. And that's my two cents on the 1911 extractor discussion. The extractor is crucial for reliable function of the pistol, and understanding the geometry that goes into it will certainly aid in making your gun more reliable. 1911 reliability is not that complicated, although a lot of folks do tend to think that it is, but having a good extractor that has been properly tuned will certainly make any gun more reliable. If you enjoyed this video about the 1911 extractor, you'd probably enjoy the videos from Engineer's Armory. I love the videos that he puts out as they're nice and technical, and I always feel like I learn something when I watch them. I'd also recommend that you check out the description down below to see the resources that I used in the making of this video. While you're down in the description, you'll also see links to the three websites that I write for, along with the Patreon page for the channel where I show a lot of my behind the scenes things that I'm working on, and the link to the Discord server for the channel. The Discord server is growing, and we have a ton of great conversations and they are pretty much on the daily these days, albeit that lately it's been Smith & Wesson's bad quality control with revolvers and canned mackerel. So if you enjoy canned mackerel and bad revolvers, join the server. We'd be happy to have you. Thank you so much for watching and I couldn't do it without you. Have a wonderful day.